Hey everybody, welcome to lesson number nine in this Bible study series on prayer. It is a topical Bible study, so we are all over scripture from one week to the next. Today, we're going to be in Mark chapter 11, verses 20 through 25. So you'll need your Bible or your Bible app open to Mark chapter 11. And there is always, uh, as always, a listening guide for this lesson. You'll find it the same place you found this video. Just scroll down and click on that link. It is a PDF that you can download and then print out. There are some blanks to fill in during the teaching portion of the lesson, and there are some discussion questions there for you uh, for afterwards, for you and your small group or you and your family. Uh, before we jump into the lesson today, let's pray together, shall we? Father, um, Lord, teach us to pray. That's the desire of our heart in this study. Week after week, we come before you and we open your word and we see what you have to say to us about prayer. We want to learn. Uh, we want to learn how to be in communion with you on a regular basis uh, and, and make it as effective as possible for all the reasons that you've given us. And so will you pour into us, Father. Will you open our hearts, even today as we open your word? Will you change how we see ourselves, how we understand prayer, how we see the world around us? Will you change how we see you? Will you continue to transform us more and more into the people you have called us to become? Lord, teach us to pray. That's our desire. We love you. We love your word and its place in our lives. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're looking at prayer as a central discipline to the Christian walk. And what does that mean? And week after week, we're asking the same couple of questions, no matter what passage we're looking at. We're asking, number one, what does this passage teach me about prayer? And number two, how does this lesson cause me to pray? That's by far the more important question. How does this cause me to pray? How does it change how I pray? Over the last couple of weeks, we've had lessons on two weeks ago, prayers for strength and how important that is and how that looks and how that works in our lives. And then last week, we looked at an actual prayer from Jesus himself, the high priestly prayer in John 17, to learn how Jesus prayed and what could we learn from that. Today, we're going to be talking about praying in faith, that is, praying with a, a level of confidence as a result of our own spiritual discernment, as a result of engaging with, uh, with the spiritual world and with God himself and understanding God's will at a deeper level so that it affects how we pray. That's what we'll be talking about today. We're in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, the Gospel of Mark is not an eyewitness account the way Matthew is, uh, the way John's is. Uh, the Gospel of Mark is written by a young man named John Mark. I say young because at the time Jesus was here, he was very young. Uh, and we, we first see him uh, by name in the book of Acts. He was the young cousin of Barnabas in the book of Acts, who was uh, Paul's uh, colleague, missionary colleague, Paul and Barnabas going on missionary trips together. And they actually took uh, young John Mark with them on a missionary journey, and he did not last on that journey. He ended up leaving prematurely and going back home. We don't know all the reasons for that. Maybe it was just too rugged a life for him. Maybe he was just too young. Maybe he was homesick. There's no telling, uh, but it did not make Paul happy, and the reason we know that is because when it came time to take the next missionary journey, Barnabas wanted to bring John Mark again with them, and Paul wouldn't have any of it. And John, uh, uh, Paul and Barnabas actually split over this. They actually fought over this and ended up splitting and going two different directions for, for a time. Uh, eventually it was resolved, but uh, for a time it was an issue. Uh, and that's the same John Mark that gives us the Gospel of Mark. Uh, we believe that John Mark probably spent a good amount of time in Rome with the Apostle Peter. Christian tradition holds that that is probably where he got most of his information for his gospel account by listening to the sermons from the Apostle Peter. 
And I think the reason scholars believe that, many of them, is because many of the perspectives that we get in the Gospel of Mark seem to be uniquely Peter-esque perspectives, uh, things that only Peter would have since known or said. Uh, and so it, it's, there are times, there are moments in the Gospel of Mark where you think, well, that's very, that sounds a lot like Peter. Uh, and so that's where that Christian tradition comes from. Uh, the other thing to know about the Gospel of Mark is that it was written, he wrote it in a very Romanesque storytelling style, uh, appealing to the Roman storytelling style, as opposed to Matthew, which was more of a Hebrew storytelling style, or Luke, which was more of a Greek storytelling style. The Roman style of storytelling was very action-packed, was very dynamic. Suddenly this happened, and then this happened, and this happened, all about the actions, all about the movement in the story, not so much detail about character development or long conversations like you might get in the Gospel of John. That's the Gospel of Mark's storytelling style. When we get to chapter 11, we are in Jesus's final week before his crucifixion. Uh, and so we have this rhythm of he's, he, he and the apostles are staying in Bethany, probably at the home of Mary and Martha, and every day making the 30 to 40 minute journey into uh, Jerusalem from, Beth, from outside, in, from Bethany, and then back home at the end of the day and then back the next day. So they were there for Passover. Uh, and so for, for that entire week, they were making this journey back and forth. Um, and that's where we pick up in our story today, in our passage today, beginning in verse 20. The previous day, on the previous day's journey, uh, on the way in, Jesus uh, was hungry and saw a fig tree in the distance and saw that unusually this fig tree already had leaves on it. And so uh, with a fig tree, ordinarily, if it's producing leaves, it's supposed, it should be producing fruit at the same time. So he walked over, walked the distance to the fig tree. This happened the day before. And there were lots of leaves, which was unusual for this time of year, but there was no fruit. Uh, and Jesus cursed that fig tree that day before. And so we pick up on, in our lesson today on the following day, according to the Gospel of Mark. It was the following day uh, when we pick up in verse 20 of chapter 11. And this is what it sounds like. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, have faith in God. All right, what is this about? First of all, Mark notes uh, that it was Peter who raised this, who noted that same fig tree that yesterday was beautiful and full of leaves and you cursed, today it has completely withered. Is that as a result, it seems, it seems to be, the implication here is it is as a result of Jesus' having cursed it. But the fact that Mark notes that it was Peter who brought this out, that's one of those kinds of instances where uh, it makes us believe maybe Mark got much of his gospel from Peter. Peter would have remembered being the one that raised this. Uh, Peter's exclamation of look at this fig tree, what happened to it, it implies a question, right? It implies this question, but how? How do you have the power to do that? How did you do that? How, how does that work? And Jesus is going to answer that question in today's lesson. In fact, he answers it in verse 22. Jesus answered them, have faith in God. In short, the way he did this was by faith. Jesus unpacks this a little bit further, but let's just stop here and recognize the connection that Jesus is making. There is a direct connection between faith and how God's Spirit manifests God's power through us. Let me say that again. Jesus is stating here that there is a direct connection between our faith and God's Spirit in us manifesting power through us. That's what Jesus is saying. He, that's the way he's answering this question. The reason I was able to do this is because of faith. Well, we've addressed this in previous lessons, this idea, this reality that the Spirit of God himself abides in us as believers. We have access to 
the spirit of the creator of the universe living in us. The very same power that resurrected Jesus from the dead lives in us today as believers. And so we've talked about that in some of our prior lessons. Jesus' point here is that activating that power, act, actually mobilizing that power, having the use of that power is a direct function of our faith. It's a direct function of our faith. Now, later in this passage, he, he will likewise address the ramifications of that in our prayer life. But for now, let's just stay with this idea of faith. For now, let's just stop and recognize this huge, impo hugely important connection between my faith and the power of the Spirit working in me. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the first statement on your listening guide. Faith, as Jesus talked about it, is much more than mere intellectual belief. It is a level of engagement with the spiritual reality of God that activates His very power within us as believers. And so faith becomes more than just about what do I believe. It's more than just about what I say with my mouth or what I believe in my head. It is actual engagement with the spiritual forces around us with the Spirit of God Himself living in us. It is engaging that Spirit to manifest Himself through us. That's a big piece of what faith means when Jesus talks about faith. But He presses into the idea even further then with an illustration. Listen to what He says in verse 23. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, no doubt referring to a mountain right there, a little a hillside right there in front of them, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. So a faith that can move mountains. You've probably heard that phrase before. This is where that phrase comes from. It comes from Jesus' own teaching. And by the way, this is not the only time that Jesus used that illustration to talk about faith. Uh, Matthew records the story of the disciples being uh, unable to cast out a particular demon from a boy. This is in Matthew chapter 17. Um, that the, the Peter and James and John have gone with Jesus up on the Mount of Transfiguration and the rest of the disciples are left at the foot of the mountain and a demon-possessed boy is brought to them. Now they've been casting out demons and so they probably thought to themselves this should be no problem but then they're unable to cast the demon out. Jesus and, and Peter, James, and John all come down from the mountain. Jesus asks them what's going on. They explain, and their question is, why weren't we able to cast out this demon? Listen to what he says in Matthew chapter 17, verse 20. You don't have enough faith, Jesus told them. I tell you the truth, if you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to, here to there, and it would move, and nothing would be impossible. And so there again, he uses the same illustration about faith and moving mountains. Note what seems to be key to Jesus' point. What seems to be the key is, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass. Again, this is more than just confidence. This is more than just, I'm pretty sure I have an intellectual understanding of this. Uh, this is a deep comprehension of a spiritual reality. It's almost, it's almost on the same level of prophetic seeing that we see in the Bible. Prophetic seeing. A prophet saying this is what's going to come to pass and he's speaking about it as if he has already seen it happen and it has already taken place. He's that confident. It's that level of faith and that level of engagement with spiritual discernment. How do we get that level of faith? Well, I believe it is through spiritual discernment of what God already intends to do. I believe that that level of faith comes from a discerning of the heart of God that makes us understand, makes, makes us know without any doubt in our mind, this is what God is doing this is what he's about to do. I know it as if I've already seen it take place. That's the level of faith that we're talking about here. Remember from last week's passage in uh, the Gospel of John? Um, in John 
14, that was not last week's passage, but earlier in the conversation, Peter said to the disciples, when everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. In other words, he's promising them, I'm about to leave you. I'm going to eventually ascend and go into heaven, but I will get things there ready for you, and then I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. That's his promise to them earlier in the evening. But then when he prays later in the evening, in John chapter 17, this was from our lesson last week, and look at what he prays. Father, I want these whom you have given me to be with me where I am. Then they can see all the glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. So he's praying with confidence about something that he already knows is going to happen. In fact, he promised it to them just earlier in the evening. That's what we're talking about in terms of praying what we already know God intends to do. It it takes us out of the realm. It takes this whole idea of um, you, if you have faith, you can move mountains and it will ask whatever you want and God will do it from you. It takes that whole idea out of the realm of asking God for things that we want and thinking that this is a promise that he's going to do it. Rather, this puts it squarely in the realm of faith is about growing to understand what God's going to do, what, God, what, what God's will is, and praying in line with what we know is God's will. That's the context for what Jesus is teaching here. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the second statement on your listening guide. Faith that moves mountains has nothing to do with our will or with our own selfish desires. It is about growing in our understanding of God's perfect will and praying in that direction. That's what Jesus is referring to here. Jesus then ties this lesson on faith to the concept of prayer, and thus it is a part of this unit for us to study prayer because he's about to tie this all together with prayer. Look what he says in verse 24. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Okay, again, let's not miss the foundational piece to this lesson, which grounds faith or belief in tightly with complete surrender to God's perfect will. Our faith, our belief, is very much intertwined with and inseparable from our surrender to God's perfect will and eventually our discernment of God's perfect will. Listen to how Jesus would say it in Matthew chapter 18. In in, in Matthew 18 verse 19, he says, Again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. In my name. In other words, where two or three of you gather together and pray in accordance with the nature and purposes of who I am, then you have power. Again, he said it in John chapter 14, John 14, verse 12, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done. You'll have these same powers and even greater works because I'm going to be with the Father. You can ask for anything, here it is again, in my name and I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. So in Jesus' name, this is where when you hear people pray and at the very end of their prayer, sometimes they will end their prayer by saying, we pray all of this in Jesus' name. This is where that comes from, this idea of asking in Jesus' name in accordance with the nature and purposes of who Jesus was, what Jesus was. It is surrendering to His will. It's very much the way Jesus prayed in Gethsemane. These are the things, this is what I want, but what I want more, Father, is what you want. I am surrendering to your will. I want your will to be done. Even in the model prayer, thy will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. So it is a complete surrendering to God's will. That's what it means to ask or to pray in Jesus' name. And that's what he's 
draw, that's the attention he's drawing us to in this lesson. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the third statement in, in, uh, in your listening guide. Saying in Jesus' name at the end of a prayer is not a magical incantation assuring us of the success of the prayer. That's not what it is at all. Rather, when it is heartfelt, it is a way of acknowledging our surrender to what God wants as opposed to what we want. That's what it means to pray in Jesus' name. And that's the kind of prayer, that's the kind of faith that is involved with moving mountains. Not only must we check our heart regarding being fully surrendered to God, but we must also check our heart with regard to our relationship with other brothers and sisters around us. That's where Jesus goes next. So it's not only, it's not only a vertical relationship, we must also check our heart with regard to our horizontal relationship with the people around us. Look what he says, verse 25. And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. All right, this is the same teaching that Jesus taught on the Sermon on the Mount when he taught about prayer, when he taught the model prayer. When you pray, say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who, tre- who trespass against us. And so it's the same thing he taught there because at the end of that teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, he circled back and he said, now here's something important about forgiveness. Listen to what he says, Matthew 6, verse 14. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. So what does that mean? That's the same thing he's teaching here in our passage today. He taught in the Sermon on the Mount as well. And by the way, it's also the same thing that the Apostle Paul teaches to the church in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Listen to what he says. Be kind, this is the Apostle Paul, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Jesus taught that there is necessarily a connection between God's forgiveness of our sins and our forgiveness of others' uh, uh, affronts or, or sins against us. The parable of the unforgiving servant reminds us of that in, in Matthew chapter 18. Remember, he, he tells this, Peter asks this question about how often must I forgive, and Jesus tells this parable uh, of a servant who owed his master more money than he would ever be able to repay in his lifetime, and his master brought him before him, and, and, and he fell to his knees, and he said, Have mercy on me. Please don't kill me. Uh, I will pay you back. And his master said, You don't owe me anything. And he wiped away the debt. He had pity for him, and he wiped away the debt. But the servant didn't apparently did not re- receive that. He didn't live into that forgiveness. Rather, he went out and began shaking his friends down who owed him money. And it made the master very upset. The master brought him in, and and the parable ends by Jesus saying, and the master had him thrown into the dungeon to be tortured until he shall repay everything he owed. But at that point, Jesus steps out of the parable and into real life, and here's what he says in Matthew 18, verse 35. He says this to his disciples. That's what my heavenly Father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. So what is Jesus doing here? Why is, he, why is he bringing this concept of forgiveness in with this lesson on having faith in God and how we pray in that faith? Because he sees them, Jesus sees them as all intertwined together, inseparable. Our faith in God is dependent and grounded, upon, grounded in the forgiveness that God gives to us. But if we don't live into that forgiveness, right? If we don't receive that forgiveness and live into it in a way that causes us necessarily to forgive people around us, then we haven't really received that forgiveness. Then we're not really walking in faith. Jesus sees all of these things as all part of the same issue, which is faith, which is all about our faith. His point is that though God's forgiveness is there for us to be be taken and available for all of us, we have to choose to accept it 
and live into it. One of the ways we live into it is by turning and extending it to others. God has given this to me. I'm going to share it now with others. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the the final statement on your listening guide. Never underestimate the seriousness with which God views unforgiveness. How dare we not forgive a brother or sister when God has already forgiven us for so much more? It is an eternal truth. An unforgiving heart cannot pray effectively. So what are our takeaways from this passage? Summarizing what we've said, there are four. Number one, uh, faith is more than just an intellectual belief. It is a high level of engagement with the spiritual realities of God. Uh, Number two, faith that moves mountains is about growing in our understanding of what God wants and then praying in that direction. Number three, praying in Jesus' name means surrendering to what God wants. And number four, an unforgiving heart cannot pray effectively. Those are some of my takeaways. I wonder what yours are. I hope that you're discussing these passages with a small group or with family or with friends all through the week. Uh, I am loving these lessons. I hope you are as well. Uh, I will be right here next week to pick up where we've left off. We're going to be in the book of Nehemiah next week. I can't wait for that lesson. In the meantime, I hope you guys have a blessed week. I love you guys, and I will see you next time.